I don't know of a place that has a Wednesday night service that is quite like this place. I can honestly say there's a lot of places that I could be in the middle of the week that would be fun, and I'd be having a blast right now and not be here, but there's no place I would rather be than in his presence that we feel right now. <laughs> Musicians, singers, thank you guys, myself not included, but uh, you guys can be seated. If you'll get your Bibles out. Two quick portions of scripture I want to get into, and they're both in Matthew, so they're going to be pretty easy to find. Matthew 21, 42, and then jumping back to Matthew chapter 16. And while you're finding that, I just want to say, Pastor Anthony, thank you so much for the opportunity, the confidence you put in me. I know you guys probably get sick and tired of hearing me say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. These guys put a lot of times more faith in me than I have in myself don't know that that's the smartest decision all the time on their part, but they do. But I just want to say, I love all of our elders, Pastor Anthony, Elder Randy, all the opportunities you've afforded me. I just want to publicly say thank you to both of you. Matthew 21, 42 says, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same stone has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in your eyes. Now, before we jump to my other scripture, I just want to say that I like to consider myself a bit of an expert on what you would call sarcasm. You can laugh. I, you're not hurting my feelings. But I want you to notice at the end of this scripture, Jesus doesn't end it with a period or an exclamation point. He ends it with a question mark, which is kind of how I would almost sarcastically end a text that I was sending to somebody. So I like to think of my Jesus in this situation as being a little bit sarcastic, saying, hey, this stone that was discarded is now the head, the cornerstone, the foundation of what everything will be built upon. And you're looking at me like you're surprised? Like I couldn't do it? Like it's weird that something that was cast aside is now the main foundation of this entire building? I like a sarcastic Jesus. I don't know about you guys. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19 says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Pastor, would you pray? You can be seated in this place tonight. I want to talk to you guys for the short time that I'm up here. The rock and a hard place. How many has ever felt like they were stuck between a rock and a hard place? I read a story about a little nine-year-old boy named Joey a while back. He went to Sunday school, and when he was done, his mom asked him, What did you learn in Sunday school? And he said, well, Mom, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind the enemy lines on a rescue mission. He was sent behind the enemy lines to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. Once that was done, he began to make their, their evac. And he said, they come up to the Red Sea, so he got on the horn with the Israeli Corps of Engineers and had him build a pontoon bridge. And the entire nation of Israel crossed on the bridge, and just as they were finishing and the Egyptian army came in behind him. He used his walkie-talkie, and he called in an airstrike, and bombers came in and blew the bridge up and stopped the Egyptian army because they were between a rock and a hard place. And his mom looked at him and said, Joey, is that really what your teacher said? And he said, no, Mom, it's not, but if I told you, you wouldn't believe me anyway. That's how our God works. He takes an impossible situation 
he takes the hard place and he places himself the rock on the other side of it you might look at me like I'm kind of crazy right now thinking why is he up here talking about rocks why is a rock so important one of the most important and symbolic not just Christian but the most symbolic places in all of religion the Muslims the Jews the Christians all of us is the dome of the rock it stems from traditions regarding the rock known as the foundation stone or the foundation rock which is at the heart of this temple it bears great significance for all three religions. The foundation rock is the rock that is at the center of the dome in Jerusalem. It's known as the pierced stone or pierced rock because of a small hole in the southeastern corner that enters a cavern beneath the rock, known as the well of souls. It's the holiest site in all of Judaism. Jewish tradition sees this as the spiritual junction between heaven and earth. Jews traditionally face the stone or the rock while praying in the belief that it was the location of the holiest of holies in the temple to this day the Jews still pray facing the rock to this day the people of God pray facing the rock when they have a desire or they have a question that they want to take to God they cling not to any not to any other symbolism not to a cross not to a necklace not to a ring they cling to the rock because that is where heaven comes down and meets the earth and our needs are met the people of God I don't care if it's today throughout the Bible or throughout history we always seem to be stuck in a predicament whether it was the Jews being captive in Egypt or Babylon the Roman Empire murdering Christians or what we're going through today Make no mistake about it, socially, this is the greatest attack on Christianity that this world has ever seen. We always, as the people of God, seem to be stuck. And there's a lot of cliches between a rock and a hard place. We've painted ourselves in, ourselves in a corner. I used to work with a lot of old pipe fitters that used to use terms like, I feel more nervous than a nine-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Or... I feel like a medical malpractice lawyer who suddenly needs major surgery. That's the type of situations that we as Christians seem to find ourselves in. We're always stuck between the rock and some hard place. You ever feel like life has just beat you up? Like God is nowhere to be found? He can't possibly be around or even care about what's going on. Like there's a Red Sea in front of you and an army from Egypt behind you. You feel stuck between a rock and in a hard place but can we starting right now flip our mentality we see that hard place is our trial but can we stop for just a second pointing our finger at a rock and say it's the rock I'm sick of be being stuck between situation and situation I want to be stuck between situation and the rock I want to be stuck between trial and my rock I want to stuck be mm. I want to be between my persecution and my rock no longer am I going to allow myself to be surrounded on every side because I have God standing beside me. He is that rock. He is the foundation that we stand upon. When we cling to the rock, we have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. We can bind the enemy. We can loose his spirit. We can control what goes on in the spiritual realm when we cling to that rock. When Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, he was stuck between a hard place having to sacrifice his son and the rock that he had set up for an altar. Abraham, as hard as it was, chose the rock. Jacob was in a barren, dead land with nothing and nobody around him. No support, nothing. He was running for his life in the middle of a desert, and he rested his head at night and found peace and rest on a rock. How many times do we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place in life and we feel like giving up? When did we decide that our hard place was too much for the rock? 
When do we decide that the situation, the life that's been handed to us is not what we deserve? It's not good enough for us. God, why did you give me something? I should be elevated. I should be up here. I should be making this. I should be doing this. I should be up here. But you've placed me in some life down here. And instead of attacking the hard place, we blame the rock. And I'm not up here throwing stones because I do it too. But let me tell you why we do it. We are flesh. We have a problem. We have a victim mentality. We have a woe is me attitude. No matter what happens, we feel like we're being handed punishments we didn't deserve. Like what God has allowed to happen just isn't good enough for me. Elder Randy, love you to death. This man says one of the most profound things I have ever heard in my life. Stop giving the enemy credit for your situation. On very, very rare occasions, I'll see him post something on Facebook that says, been a rough morning or going to be a rough week at work. And almost always, somebody comments, that's the enemy attacking you, brother. It's the enemy. And every time he comes back with, hold up, hold up, hold up. It's a bad day at work. I'm not giving him credit for a single thing. We're so often quick to give the enemy credit for the things he doesn't deserve. Car broke down last week. That's an attack of the enemy. Kids get sick. That's the enemy attacking my family. Get laid off work. That's that old devil at it again. House gets broke into and my TV gets stolen. Well, that's just the enemy coming at you. When did we decide that the devil has even done enough to earn credit for the bad situations that we're in in the first place? When did we make the decision that that foundation that God has given us is not enough and not strong enough to take us through the situation he's putting us through? Let me tell you guys about a prayer that I'm sick of praying. How many times have we prayed, God, come against the attack of the enemy in my life? God, stop the attack of the enemy in my life. God, put a hedge of protection around me in my life. Now, there's nothing wrong with those prayers, but frankly, I'm sick of praying them. Let me tell you my new prayer. My new prayer is, God, make me strong enough spiritually that when Satan walks down his rank and file and he sees his demons and he picks one out to attack me, that demon shakes. Mm. When he walks up and he picks two and says, go attack Anthony Moss, they begin to tremble. When he picks ten and says, attack the North Charleston Apostolic Church, they turn to him and say, no, no. They asked for the same thing they asked Jesus. When he cast out the legion, they didn't say, send us to attack again. They said, send us into the swine so we can go down and drown ourselves. Because that is better for us than to stand up and fight what you put us up against. How can we be so bold about our rock? What's so special about our rock that gives me this authority or this power over the enemy? Deuteronomy chapter 32 tells us that their rock is not as our rock. Job 39 says she dwells and abides in the rock, upon the crag of the rock, in the strong place. I've got one question. You ask, how can I be so bold about the rock? How can you not be so bold about our rock? How can we not be able to stand up with a backbone against the enemy, knowing what God has done for us? We so often pray that the enemy doesn't attack us. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm at a point in my life where the enemy is praying not to attack me. I'm at a point in my life where cancer is scared to death to enter my family. I'm at a point where sickness and disease, hmm, I'm not going to say they can't attack my family. They have every ability to do it. But I'm telling you right now, any cancer cell, any demon that attacks my family, it better know it's in for the fight of its life. Not because of my power, not because of my authority, but because I know that I can cling to the rock.
as a church, we need to be so spiritually strong that when somebody walks in this place with any affliction, I don't care what it is, their attitude shouldn't be, I'm sick, I should go get prayed for. Their attitude should be, I'm going to go get prayed for so I'm no longer sick. When someone comes in and they're struggling with attacks of the enemy and they're struggling with demons in their life and they're struggling with things that they shouldn't be struggling with, I'm sick and tired of us having to sit here feeling like we need to pray for hours and hours and fall on our face and cry and beg and plead for the enemy to leave. Not the way it happened in the Bible. Not the way we do it in this church. This church in the last couple of months since we've been back has gone into a whole new level in the spirit. And I don't know if some of you know this, but I think it's pretty common knowledge that this church has come under attacks like it's never come against before. But I don't know if Satan is well aware of this fact tonight. He's given us his best shot. He's tried to hit our top people. He's tried to take down our families. He's tried to destroy our lives. He's come against people's jobs. He's come against people's marriages. He's come against your parents. He's come against your children. He's come against your finances. But let me tell him, I and we are still here. And we're not going anywhere. Because I don't care how hard he hits us. I don't care what kind of punch he throws. We're on the rock, Elder. We're standing on the rock. Pastor, we are clinging to a rock, and that rock will not be moved. The musicians and singers can go ahead and come. I promise I wouldn't be long tonight. But you see, without a rock, David doesn't defeat the Goliath. Without a rock, the wise man's house falls off into the sea and is destroyed. Without a rock, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had no altar. Without a rock, Moses and the children of Israel die of thirst in a desert. And it's all because of the rock. And if we, the chosen people of God, choose to remain silent... God will still receive his glory, his praise from a rock. If our praise and our worship is so powerful in this place tonight that even it can be manifested in a rock, how much more powerful is it when it comes from us? How much more powerful is our rock? than an inanimate object land that can spontaneously cry out and praise and worship. We have a power in the rock. We have authority in the rock. The rock is the cornerstone of the entire foundation of the building that we call the temple of God that is us. Without that rock, without that, sal without that foundation, there's nothing. There is no power. There is no authority. There is no salvation. And I don't know about you tonight, but I'm standing on a rock that will not move. And I want to invite every single person in this place to stand at the front of this altar and begin to declare and proclaim that no longer am I standing on anything weak, no longer am I standing on my own, no longer am I leaning on man, no longer am I leaning on flesh, but I'm clinging to a rock that will not move. Because I'm here to tell you tonight that if you think the enemy is going to run even after what we've been through the last couple months, if you think the enemy for a split second is even considering a retreat 
or a stop in his advances and his attacks against us, I'm telling you, you're going to be in for a big surprise. I'm not here to give you some sugar-coated spiritual philosophy that says everything is going to be all right and it's going to be easy and you're never going to come against any resistance. I'm telling you that the enemy has attacked our pastor. He's attacked our elders. He's attacked our singers. He's attacked our musicians. He's attacking our ushers. He's attacking our prayer warriors. He's attacking our saints. But we are still here. I'm here to tell the enemy tonight, I'm not praying for you to run away from me. But when you come up against me, you're going to be praying for the first opportunity to leave. Because this battle is not mine. Battle is not yours. The battle is not ours, it's God's. The battle belongs to the rock. The victory belongs to the rock. And all we have to do is cling to it and give it over to Him. And the enemy has absolutely nothing that he can throw at us that we can't withstand. Not ashamed, not afraid, not back and down anymore. We have the victory. person in this place to stand tonight here in a minute we're going to pray in the Holy Ghost that this word that God has delivered tonight will take root in the heart and mind and spirit of every individual in this place and that we have a message for the enemy we're no longer standing our ground we're taking back the territory you stole from us no longer are we going to sit here and simply take the punches you throw we're striking back no longer will we simply stay put in this fight with the enemy. We're going to be champions. Everybody in this place, pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, I want you to raise your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost right now. By the power that worketh on the inside of you, exercise that power in the name of Jesus. Hey, you've got power. I've got power. Every one of us has power. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the authority of the Word of God, and by the power of the name of Jesus, we take our territory in the name of Almighty God. Evo Sunday at Abaha. We are on the winning side. We are on the winning side. We are on the winning side. Evo Sunday at Abaha. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not ashamed, not afraid, not back down anymore. We have the 